Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Trinity Long Room Hub online. My name is Eve Patton, and I'm director of the Hub, which is Trinity's Arts and Humanities Research Institute. Over the past year, as many of you will know, uh, Trinity's Long Room Hub has been pleased to partner with uh, a new research initiative, and this is the Centre for Resistance Studies, a very dynamic community which has been spearheaded by my colleagues Balaja Poor and Rosa Fagelli, among others, who join us this evening. Uh, the Centre for Resistance Studies is dedicated to pursuing research and activities that relate to various types and forms of resistance and to related concepts of opposition, dissent, uh, resilience and protest. For my colleagues, I know that the founding of the Centre for Resistance Studies in Trinity was not so much an option as uh, a necessity, a necessity that is born of our contemporary era when we're witnessing once again the creeping advance of uh, authoritarianism, patriarchy, fascism, uh, thought control. It's in this context that I am very honoured to welcome this evening's guest speaker, whose lecture tonight is aligned with the Centre for Resistance Studies. Uh, Professor Martha Albertson Feynman joins us from Emory University. Uh, Professor Feynman, you're very welcome. She is the Robert W. Woodruff Professor there, and she is, as many of you will know, an internationally renowned scholar in law, and particularly in critical legal theory and feminist jurisprudence. Uh, she has experience both of legal practice at the US Court of Appeals and of law in academia. Uh, she began her teaching career at the University of Wisconsin in 1976. Uh, she moved in 1990 to Columbia University where she held the Morris T. Moore professorship. Uh, and she's also worked at the Cornell Law School faculty where she held the Dorothea Clark professorship. And this was the first endowed chair in feminist jurisprudence in the US. Professor Feynman is a very valuable member of the Trinity Long Room Hub's international academic community. And I'm absolutely delighted that in June 2022, she's going to be joining us as a visiting research fellow. So she'll be with us then in person. Uh, and tonight she is, of course, with us virtually. I'm delighted that we are able to host her. Um, after Professor Feynman's talk, we will be taking Q&A and uh, discussion and comments from our online audience. So please, as always, uh, feel free to submit your questions using the Q&A panel, which is at the bottom of your screen, and we'll look forward to, to getting to that discussion with you. And of course, if you're tweeting, please do tweet about the lecture using the usual hashtag, uh, Hub Matters, and the handle at TLRH. But now it is with very great pleasure that I uh, want to invite Professor Martha Feynman to speak to you on resistance and responsibility, a vulnerability analysis. Well, thank you very much for that lovely introduction. And I'm really honored to be here. Um, I must confess that I was not aware of resistance studies until fairly recently. And I look forward to learning more about uh, resistance studies when I'm in residence at Trinity College next June. Um, therefore, in this talk, I'm going to focus on vulnerability theory. Uh, and you might, um, I would now say, of course, that vulnerability theory, of course, is about resistance. Uh, but it also is a theory that while it resists dominant discourses about social justice is, perhaps for that very reason, itself resisted. So there's a lot of resistance to vulnerability theory. Now, both uh, resistance and vulnerability paradigm are concerned with issues of power and authority in society. And I'm primarily interested in three areas in regard to power. First, what is the relationship between power or authority and responsibility? That inquiry involves the question of legitimacy and also includes the role of resistance in monitoring manifestations of power. Second, 
how do we understand the individual and the, in, the individual as positioned within the larger society and its institutions? And this positioning of the individual within the collective is significant for how we re reconcile individual freedom with collective responsibility. And so you might think about this as applied power. Third, how do we as critical scholars incorporate our insights about power, responsibility, individuals and collectives in identifying and addressing the most pressing subjects and objects of theoretical concern? There's a tendency for discussions about power and responsibility to be framed in abstract terms, referencing aspirational objectives, liberty, equality, or warning of adverse consequences, oppression, uh, subordination. The pandemic and events of the past several years have revealed limitations in political theories based on su such abstractions, I would argue. And this is particularly evident in defining and achieving a sustainable compromise between the individual and the collective. The pandemic served to highlight dangers to both individual and collective well being that can arise when resistance to authority is individualized and idealized without a corresponding concern with responsibility. On the issue of power and authority, vulnerability theory concedes the inevitability of some set of enforceable rules to regulate and mediate our interactions with each other as well as the necessity of some form of governing authority to establish those rules and enforce them. Of course, there are options for sources of authority and rules. The market dominated by multinational corporations is certainly one, religion is another, or industries such as those controlling pharmaceuticals or insurance coverage but some power or authority will be employed to establish the rules that regulate social interactions. Vulnerability theory appreciates and advocates for the democratic state as a uniquely positioned mechanism for the construction of, uh, of rules for a just and inclusive society. And I want to be clear, this is not an argument that the state functions in that way, merely that it has more potential for doing so than do the alternatives. This potential has been impaired and frustrated by an impoverished notion of individual equality and liberty, which tolerates only a limited, constrained vision of the state. The resulting diminished notion of state responsibility has left societal well being to the activities of hapless individuals or displaced onto largely privatized sets of unrepresentative and unregulated societal institutions. Vulnerability theory challenges this impaired vision, drawing on the potential of law to craft a concept of social or inclusive justice built around an ethics or of care or responsibility. Law is the tool of the state, and there are certain principles that should govern the way law is generated and applied. Law functions to provide the structures that are applicable to everyone within society, forming the compulsory systems that shape the day-to-day -day relationships we have with each other, as well as defining the relationship between the governing system and those that are governed. Importantly, to be perceived as legitimate, laws must be of general or uniform applicability. And we express this principle of general applicability or universal applicability with maxims such as rule of law or sayings such as no one is above the law and through doctrines such as equal protection. We're all familiar with those. And the comprehensive all encompassing nature of law mandates the construction of a unitary legal subject. Now, by legal subject, I mean the imagined ordinary being around which law and policy are crafted. 
this being becomes the foundational or elementary human subject of law. Since the effectiveness, appropriateness, and justice of specific laws ultimately will be judged by how well they reflect and address the lived reality of real human beings. The authenticity and integrity of this devised being, this subject of law is critical. The legal subject must encompass and integrate the totality of the human condition. Now I'm gonna to try to switch to um, PowerPoint. So let's hope that that works. All right, it's not letting me um, do the slideshow here for some reason. Would, would you like if I just shared the slides? Uh, that would be great because it's, Perfect. it's yeah, yeah, it's not letting me do this. Thank you. Are you taking over now? Yeah, I'll share the slides. Then. Slide one. <laughs> Vulnerability theory approaches the task of defining the legal political subject by posing two fundamental questions. What does it mean to be human? Second, given our understanding of what it means to be human, what institutions, relationships, and rules are required for the construction of a just society? The first question is a descriptive or empirical question. In asking it, we are beginning to define the nature of the legal political subject. This is the individual. The second question is the normative or political question, asking us to reflect on the societal implications of our humanness. This is the collective question. In response to the first question, what does it mean to be human? A vulnerability theorist would respond, to be human is to be vulnerable. Vulnerability constitutes and defines the human condition. Our vulnerability arises from the fact that we are embodied beings. As such, we are universally consistent and constantly susceptible to changes in our bodily and societal well-being. Uh, could you change the slide, please? There are two components to a vulnerability analysis. We are embodied, and because of the nature and limitations of our embodiment, we are also inescapably embedded in societal institutions and relationships. Vulnerability theory begins with the body, or more accurately, begins with reasoning or theorizing from the body. The body is a foundational theoretical concept in vulnerability theory. It is an ontological or anthropological concept exp expressing a fundamental material reality. Okay, next slide, please. There are, of course, differences among bodies, differences associated with demographic categories such as race, sex, and so on. And these have led to law and policies designed to eliminate, rectify, or compensate harms resulting from exclusion, discrimination, marginalization, and so forth. So we're all aware of these demographic differences and the rules that have evolved to address them. Vulnerability theory recognizes those differences, of course, and specific harms, but asks us also to consider a different, more fundamental form of difference, one that re reflects a shared human condition and one that is ignored or evaded in law or policy. Next slide, please. These are developmental differences. Each human body inevitably changes over time. Note important here, the ontological body is not only or even primarily the site of decline, not only weak and fragile. Its development generates, even necessitates, innovation, creativity, and initiative. As our intellectual, emotional, and physical capacities evolve over time, these changes facilitate creative and constructive adaptations on an individual level. Significantly, on a public policy level, some positive changes can be encouraged, 
over time, or negative changes deterred. And many changes are predictable, so they can be anticipated and planned for in social policy. The unavoidable fact about the body is that profound changes are inescapable, and many of those changes are not within our individual or even our collective control. This susceptibility to change defines the human condition in vulnerability theory. New slide, please. Vulnerability reflects our universal, our inevitable, inescapable susceptibility to change, both positive and negative, in our physical, embodied, and social embedded well being over the life course. Of course, these facts about body and change are all perfectly obvious. I'm sure you're thinking that. So, a fair question might be why do I initially dwell on this bodily change in this presentation? I do so because the social and policy implications of this developmental aspect of the ontological body are resisted by both individuals and governments. Vulnerability is not reflected in the laws, norms, values, and aspirations we have established for our society and its institutions, at least not largely so. It is not the bedrock of our understanding of responsibility in either its individual or collective dimension. Our legal subject projects abstract notions of equality, freedom, and autonomy as, those, as though these were desirable and attainable human qualities. Uh, new slide, please. And this is the Brooks Brother version of the autonomous liberal legal subject. An idealized legal subject is cast as independent, autonomous, and liberty-seeking, leaving the body behind. As a result, law and policy not only very narrowly defines interests and legitimate province of the state, as well as the extent of state or collective responsibility for, for both individual and societal well-being. So the way that we understand the individual shapes the way we understand state responsibility. Now, law is not alone in this failure. Other disciplines also neglect the vulnerable subject in spinning out their theories. The liberty-seeking, reasonable man we find in law and politics is also the rational actor in economics, the autonomous consenting being in ethics, and the competent rights holder who is capable of pursuing and protecting his interests through things like human rights. He informs the doctor-patient relationship, is present throughout accounts of history, psychology, political science, sociology, and so on. A question here, my, one of my questions, many questions, um, might be who or what is the subject of resistance theory? What characterizes and defines the resistant subject? Maybe we can address that in discussion. In any case, these underdeveloped, incomplete subjects of theory represented here by the autonomous liberal legal subject are taken out of social relationships and institutions, which are the very structures in which we both experience our vulnerability and upon which we depend for the resources to ameliorate our vulnerability. Uh, next slide, please. These theoretical subjects are radically individualized subjects abandoned to the conceptual devices of consent, contract, agency, and rights, which are woefully inadequate to address the inescapable and lifelong dependence on society and its institutions that our vulnerability entails. Of course, in a world in which vulnerability is resisted and autonomy and independence define the legal subject, individuals are bound to fail. And we see that all around us today in the neoliberal dystopia that has been created. The abdication of, this, of state responsibility has resulted in distinctive social harms, poverty, deprivation, and inequality for many in society. These are individualized harms produced by the profound neglect or callous indifference and disregard on the part of the state to the realities of the human condition. 
But the harm extends beyond that done to the individuals, I would argue. Such profound neglect is a violation of the very rationale for the existence of governance and law, a rejection of the responsibility and principles that legitimate the constitution of the state in the first instance. In other words, they are also a constitutional harm. Now recall at this point, the second question of vulnerability theory, theory asks us to consider. Given our understanding of what it means to be human, what institutions, relationships, and rules are required for the construction of a just society? This is our task. Here we consider the political, moral, and ethical implications of our understanding of what it means to be human. New slide, please. Which brings us to the embedded component of the theory and the concept of dependency. The fundamental reality is that the physical and developmental realities of the human body render us inescapably embedded in, dependent upon societal relationships and institutions throughout our lives. Dependency is not a variation or example of vulnerability, but the inevitable manifestation and a realization of it. We resist this realization both as individuals and as societies, but at our peril. Importantly, dependency should not be considered only or primarily negative and stigmatized as it is. From an institutional pr perspective, dependency is profoundly generative. Our innate dependency is the impetus for us as a species to come together in families, in communities, to form political organizations, both local and international. Our dependency is the very basis for society and its institutions. Social relationships and structures provide the resources that simultaneously give us the ability to adapt, adjust, survive, even thrive in our uh, vulnerability. In vulnerability theory, we call this resilience. And importantly, no one is born resilient. Rather, resilience is acquired over time within social institutions and relationships, institutions and relationships that are created by law and policy. Note in this regard that on an individual level, dependence on social institutions, although it's constant, varies and fluctuates over time in response to circumstances or developmental stages against the development of the human body. Uh, the individual, for example, in, in infancy is inevitably dependent on care from social institutions such as the family. But the birth family recedes and other institutions typically become more prominent later in an individual's life when the need for care arises only occasionally, such as when we're ill or injured. In other words, individual dependence on any specific or particular institutional arrangement can be thought of as episodic, alterable, and circumstantial. However, it's important to recognize and theoretically address the reality that dependency on some set of social institutions and relationships, be they market, financial, and employment systems, or educational healthcare institutions, and so on, is inevitable and ongoing for everyone throughout life. The family and the educational system will shape an individual's success or failure in later encounters, encounters with the employment system and within the political and civic social systems, all of which will have implications for the ability of the individual to form and maintain a family, as well as to ensure their own well-being in retirement and old age. Individual dependency on institutions and relationships is not deviant or exceptional. It is the norm, it is inevitable. But importantly, dependency has an institutional as well as an individual manifestation and it's very important theoretically to realize this. For example, when it comes to individual dependency on care, the institution of the family must be perceived as dependent. So the institution of the family itself is dependent, as must those who serve institutional roles within the family. 
Within the family, those who were assigned the societal identity of caretaker are what I call derivatively dependent. New slide, please. They are dependent on resources to successfully accomplish their societal role. And here we see the inevitable dependent, the biologically dependent child and the derivative dependency of the caretaker. Um, but also this family unit is dependent on resources within the larger institutional arrangements of society. Uh, so sometimes the resources for caretaking come from within the family uh, for, the, for the caretaker. A spouse or a partner, a grandparent might provide assistance in caretaking, but they must come from other societal institutions. In other words, the family as an institution is also dependent and not only on the caretaker. Its success is linked to the successful functioning of other societal institutions, including the educational and healthcare system and the employment system or market institutions more generally, as well as the social welfare system. So we begin to see how these institutions are all symbiotically linked and share responsibility for the reproduction of society, the reproduction of members of society. Vulnerability theory mandates that the individual, when we think of the individual, the legal subject, the theoretical subject, must always be placed within complex institutional contexts in thinking about how we should assess responsibility. New slide, please. From a critical theory perspective, there are two. This is this is my attempt to envision this theoretical model uh, in some sort of chart. Uh, from a critical theory perspective, there are two significant points of focus, and both are sites of both resistance and rejection, as well as I would argue failed responsibility. First is the de design and allocation of authority across societal institutions. And here we see the state at the, at the top of this chart and uh, underneath that, all of these circles, the family system, the educational system, the employment system, and so on. These are the social and legal institutions designated both public and private or quasi-private. And across these institutions, uh, we allocate authority. Uh, and the social institutions, uh, uh, these social institutions and relationships, we depend upon for the, the um, ultimate reproduction of society. These are the products of law and policy. Even if the state is not visibly and actively engaged in the construction and design of these institutions, it's past engagement, such as deeming some functions or institutions of private rather than public concern, the corporation, market institutions, for example. This affects present arrangements and this history of past state involvement, particularly the designation of public and private, is worth exploring and critiquing. So that's one area of engagement. And when the state has decided not to be actively present in an institutional arrangement, it may also be very fruitful, critically fruitful, to inquire who or what then fills in in its absence. Who or what is making the rules and what are those rules? Who or what is left out? Who's privileged and who's disadvantaged? And again, in the context of the corporation, what are the rules that these corporations develop and whose interests are actually served? Importantly, these societal institutions serve essential roles in the reproduction of society. And they do so whether they're designated as public or private, and whether the state has deemed that they should be primarily the responsibility of private actors rather than public ones and private values rather than public values. But they serve an essential role, again, in the reproduction of societies. These institutions confer recognition and structure accommodation, supplying the often essential arrangements for future generations, as well as those already in existence. And here you can consider such things as policies that affect the environment, for example, or COVID for that matter. There's another pressing question. How effectively do these institutions provide 
individual resilience on the individual level and or the societal benefits that justify their existence. So we argue politically that we privilege corporations because they deliver jobs and economic well-being. How well do they actually do that? As already noted, the institutional, these, inter, uh, these interinstitutional relationships represented here are complex. The family, the workplace, the financial system, and so on are parts of a larger whole. The particular proportions, collaborations, and limitations of these interinstitutional relationships are not accidental, natural, or inevitable, but the product of policy and political choice. This is another source, a primary source actually, for critical commentary and engagement. All right, so cross-institutional responsibility. A second point of focus and critique is intra-institutional. And here we go down to the second level, what is, which is labeled social identities, looking at the individual social identities that are created within each institution. So social identities are initially shaped by the institution in which they function and detail the roles that individuals within those institutions are supposed to assume. These social identities are paired, complementary, often of necessity unequal, legally significant relationships. And I've put a few here for you, parent-child, employer-employee, shareholder, consumer, doctor, patient, lender, borrower, and so on. You could just go on and on and on. Through these identities, the rules of individual responsibility, power and privilege associated with the reproduction of society are distributed to individuals. And here we accomplish that using everyday law, contract, corporation, employment, family, criminal, tort law, and so on. Again, laws that affect everyone in society. None of us can live outside of these institutional arrangements. If they, can, uh, they cannot be, should not be equal, these relationships, and many of them, of course, cannot be and should not be. Uh, to talk about equality between parent and child doesn't make a whole lot of sense. Employment employer, employer-employee relationship is not a relationship of inherent equality. They serve different kinds of societal roles, have different kinds of purposes and functions. So how and when do we determine that they're just relationships? Again, not equal. They cannot and should not be equal relationships, but the vulnerability project would be, are they just? Who is privileged and why are they privileged? Again, not the fact of unequal privilege, but the justification and does it match the societal need, the societal purpose? And should or could they be adjusted to better reflect a, a, a just end? Vulnerability theory explores both the institutional and the individual relationships of distribution, both the institutions, the societal institutions and the social identities. But it does so by placing the vulnerable and dependent subject, not the autonomous independent subject at the center of law. And this displaces the liberal subject that now dominates theory. Vulnerability theory asks questions of justice and responsibility and provides a critique of the status quo, but it also provides a way to imagine a better and more just future. Thank you, and I'd love to hear questions and comments. Martha, thank you very much. Uh, absolutely fascinating to have vulnerability theory outlined for us with such clarity. Uh, I would welcome um, questions. I see they're beginning to come in into the Q&A already. And uh, while the questions are coming in, perhaps I might kick off by, by asking you, I, I listened to your talk as a, a scholar of English literature and I had Shakespeare very much to the forefront of my mind and specifically The Merchant of Venice, a play that reminds us that law itself pretends to be resilient, but in fact must inev inevitably bend to the, 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 the constitution of the human body, the pound of flesh, the spilling of blood. Um, so what I wanted to ask you was, do you think that 
in addition to recognizing vulnerability of the subject, we need to think about the law itself in terms of its own vulnerability uh, uh, in, and as being contingent, relative, rather than autonomous and fixed. Absolutely, and a big part of vulnerability theory, and I tried to fold that in in talking about the symbiotic relationship of institutions and the fact that they are contrived, you know, not natural. Um, institutions are themselves vulnerable as human creations. They are vulnerable, although differently so than individuals are vulnerable. But that's a very important, and there are a lot of uh, scholars that engage on that very level. And of course, when we talk about the state itself, the state which produces law, it is vulnerable. It's vulnerable not only to corruption and capture and so forth and so on, which we talk about all the time in theory, um, but it is also vulnerable to, to politics. And in a lot of what we see now in the distorted uh, state responses to things like COVID are in fact political responses based on state vulnerability. When you listen to a state justify its policies, uh, another big area is austerity. The state is vulnerable, so it it offers a justification or a reason why it has to act in a restrained way, why it has to have austerity policies. Um, but again, the critical project is to understand that as part of this larger thing and to, and to engage with the very arguments that the state is making to actually deconstruct them, to pull them apart and to show that there is in fact an alternative, better way of producing a just result. Um, again, I think that a, a large part of the critical project uh, it has been or tends to be criticism without thinking about how it is that we can then generate a better, you know, a, a more, a better uh, process, how it is that we take the criticism and turn it into a, you know, reform. Uh, and yeah, so, but I, but I love your merchant in Venice and I am going to um, incorporate that in a footnote for sure. <laughs> and it's free for you, Martha, of course, but let me take uh, some questions that are coming in from our audience. I want to go first, Steve Wilmer, who's uh, our colleague, um, has asked, would you include the refugee or asylum seeker or stateless person within the notion of the legal subject? And obviously a, an immensely topical question to ask there. Um, any thoughts on that? Absolutely. And the, the refugee is a product. I mean, the, the, just the category of refugee is a product of law. I mean, it's also a product of circumstances and so forth and so on. But it's, in, it's not inevitable how we actually uh, define state responsibility to those who are designated to be refugees. And there's a couple of, of um, PhD students who are actually using vulnerability theory to, to actually specifically look at refugees and to look at that in the context of a vulnerability analysis versus a human rights analysis. And um, I don't know enough about exactly how far they've come with that project, but I do know that that's underway. And if, if, he's, if Steve is interested, I can certainly put him in touch with, with, those, uh, with those students. Thank you. I'm, I'm looking at uh, three questions that have come in from Siobhan Airy, um, but I'm going to take the first one, if I understand it correctly, Siobhan, because I think it's absolutely crucial, um, which is how does vulnerability theory take account of the relationship between the human and the non-human web of life in which the human exists or in which we rely? Uh, if I understand your question, Siobhan, um, we're entering an era, of course, where the human subject is surrounded by the non-human subjects and by technological systems, which also, uh, I suppose, sustain uh, or, or provide institutions for us. So can that be factored in, Martha? This is an expanding area of law, I know, but right. is it something that vulnerability theory can, can help us with? Yes, uh, vulnerability theory, like um, feminist theory, or like law and economics, actually, um, has applicability across a, a wide variety of different areas. Uh, so again, there are students, my postdoc, whose name is Atiano Samandari, is working on vulnerability and environmental justice, environmental issues, laws. But the important thing about a vulnerability analysis is um, that it repositions the individual so that the individual becomes not this rights holder in opposition to the collective, but actually part and dependent upon um, the larger circumstances and institutions, 
including uh, the environment, both the built and natural environment. So uh, Angela Harris did a really interesting piece using vulnerability theory to talk about our dependence, not only again on water, air, so forth and so on, um, as a species, but also our dependence on the bacteria that live in our stomach for our, our well-being. So the in, internal as well as the external environment, uh, and she did a really interesting application. So there were a lot of people working, uh, working on that. But again, what vulnerability theory does and why it's an alternative to a human rights and a social contract uh, way of thinking about justice broadly speaking, is that it displaces the individual and it looks instead on the institutional and other contextual arrangements and the individual within that showing the dependence of us as individuals on those external ar arrangements. So it, it, it really, it, it just alters the, it alters your, your initial perspective. Thank you. And I know a, a, a similar version of the same question has come in from Dan Kilper. And just to note, Dan, that you've asked about how does technology and the Internet of Things fit into vulnerability theory? So uh, I, I think it's very much the same area that you just addressed. Martha, did you want to add anything yes. in relation to that question? Are these tools for resilience, he asks? Uh, again, I uh, that well, they can be, but that would not be my primary inquiry. And, and again, I get very excited about the theory because I every every week I see new applications of it that I you know that take the theory and apply it in a different area. So there's a woman, named, a young woman named Tanya. K K um, I'm sure I'm massacring her name and I really apologize, but anybody who's interested, I'll be glad to send it to you. She adapted vulnerability theory in the context of artificial intelligence to, uh, to talk about it as an ethic. Um, and there's a group in Texas also that's interested in this a group of engineering, uh, computer engineers, uh, vulnerability theory as an ethic to guide the development of artificial intelligence, um, which, you know, it, it providing the kind of ethical system, again, with the dependence of the human being and the placing of the human being in those contexts. So um, there, there's a lot, there's a lot going on. Yeah. Um, you, you talked a lot about theory, uh, Martha, and uh, uh, obviously you're, you're able to manage this material and from you know, looking at your slides, manage this material in theoretical terms, which, which some of us would recognize from other disciplines. Um, but you also showed us very concrete and practical applications, both of the theory and of your definitions of the vulnerable subject. Um, and it leads me to a question that's been asked by William Pate, who uh, has, is asking what led you down this path? What sparked your interest in vulnerability? Uh, and I suppose I would elaborate on that by thinking about your journey through academia, but also through real law as something applied and practiced um, in the Court of Appeal. Was there a particular spark that, that led to you thinking about vulnerability? And if so, was it from the real world or did it come from the rarefied circles of academia and abstract reflection. Um, I guess I, I don't draw the distinction between the real world and academia quite the same way, but let me just say, um, so my earlier work was on uh, the family as an institution and my dissatisfaction with feminist theorists who applied gender equality as the paradigm to impose on the institution of the family and talking about reforming the family. Uh, and so a 1991 book, I think it was, uh, The Illusion of Equality, where I, where I argued that to use equality to impose it on a, a, an inherently unequal set of relationships in the family was to just perpetuate more inequality. Now, the seeds of where I am today were certainly in that 1991 book, but I, of course, didn't realize it. It took me a journey through, for example, looking at the role of the family in the, in, again, in the larger context of sharing responsibility with the workplace. So the whole idea about work-family conflict that so many feminists were involved in, um, as was I. 
I, and but I came to the realization that actually it this was not a gender issue, although certainly women were disproportionately disadvantaged by the arrangement between the workplace and the family. But the real problem was that society did not value and more importantly, did not accommodate the work that was assigned in the family with the work that was assigned in the structure of the workplace. That that had to be done. Again, this symbiotic relationship with these institutions. So that led me to leave behind the traditional categories of identity. And you know, again, to recognize discrimination happens and when it does, it has to be addressed. But quite often, discrimination is not what we should be looking at. Because what do we gain if what we do is to allow inclusion, to allow people, to bring people in to in inherent social and institutional arrangements that are fundamentally unjust? We've gained nothing. We have to look at the institutional arrangements um, before we get to this question of, you know, again, this what, what is just on the individual level. So that that led uh, then the, this work with dependency in the family led to the uh, articulation of the vulnerability theory. And the first piece I did was in 2008. So it's a relatively new paradigm. It is, a, and, and it's still evolving, as I indicated. Um, just this week, someone sent me a book looking at vulnerability theory that involves vulnerability theory in the, in the, the, the Court of European Human Rights. I have no idea. I haven't had a chance to look at it. I'm really interested to see what, you know, but, but this, is, this is happening. It's still evolving. So anybody who's interested, I'd love to have you be involved. Uh, there's plenty of room for everybody. Well, clearly people are very interested and we've had a number of comments in uh, full of praise for, for your talk and presentation. Um, but Carol Ballantyne notes that, uh, and this leads on from what you've just been saying, that this term vulnerability is being used in very different ways, especially around refugee issues. Um, and she talks about the, the various uses of the label vulnerable in this context. Uh, can you talk, she says, uh, about your theories vis-a-vis -vis, uh, the almost directly contradictory ways that uh, terms like vulnerability and resilience are applied in wider policy discourse. And I suppose that intersects with uh, another of Siobhan Airy's questions, which is what's the interface between this area of law and what happens both in policy and political life? And I would add to that, what's the intersection with welfare systems, for example? Are they not meant to be doing this work? instead of putting the burden of responsibility onto the law. So that's a complex amalgam of questions, but um, over to you. Well, again, if, 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 in terms of law, the way that I view law, law shapes what constitutes social welfare. Um, law, in fact, defines the, again, these, not only the institutions, but the identities that we have within these institutions. So law is what shapes your identity as a professor, your obligations, responsibilities, your relationship with your students, your relationship with your university. All of that is the product of law. It's the Pro, again, the rules will be set. Um, I, I would argue that the, the rules law should be set, established by democratic principles, not by multinational corporations or, or whatever are the alternatives. So, so, so just so we're clear that we don't make up the conditions under which we live our day-to-day -day lives by ourselves. We live in institutional contexts that are already determined. We might resist them, but we, li but we, are, but we are resisting them because they have implications, they have, they have impact and power. Um, so I, I wanted to, to be sure about that. And now, now, I for, now of course, I've, I've forgotten the beginning of that. So just mentioned what you were what you said. I, I think the, the question from Carol Ballantyne was, again, specifically about the contexts that uh, vulnerability and resilience are used oh, yes. to do with refugee, which is a yeah. different use of the term. Well, I, uh, I again, the, refugee is only one example. So vulnerability has been used um, to designate certain quote populations. So we are very antagonistic to the notion of vulnerable populations. Vulnerability again is the universal constant human condition. All of us are vulnerable. 
Um, so, you know, to, to break that out, to break, to fracture the theoretical subject into whether it's age related, so you have the elderly and children, you have generational, or whether it's based on these demographic categories of race and gender, or whether it's based on social differences like refugee status or prisoner status or, or whatever. To do that is to fracture the notion of state responsibility. And in fact, what the use the use of or misuse, I would say, of the term vulnerability does is to prove the point of a vulnerability analysis that what we do in our in the way that we think about things and the way we position the individual vis-a-vis -vis the collective is we limit our imagination when it comes to state responsibility. We narrow it and we focus it. It's like vulnerability becomes an argument. Oh, poor vulnerable me, I need special protection. I need special consideration or you're vulnerable, um, a, a vulnerable population uh, because you're in a position where you're you, like a refugee status or a criminal status where actually you need to be supervised because you're vulnerable to you know, some horrible set of circumstances or behaviors or whatever it is. So it's, it, this is a way to stigmatize certain individuals based on characteristics rather than getting to the basic fundamental question, which should be, what is the state response? responsibility. So what should the state responsibility be to a refugee? And, you know, we resolve that now by saying, oh, well, you know, by dividing up responsibility among states and, and, and do a variety of things. We should look at the way that we're handling that, thinking, again, not about the vulnerable refugee, but the state responsibility to those who find themselves, for whatever circumstances, uh, escaping into, into our borders, into our, what, what, you know, how do we adjust? How do we deal with that kind of situation? What's the state's responsibility? responsibility in that context. Exactly. And it, it's, uh, it, it's a theme picked up on by another question here, which is also about language and terms. It's from Thomas Bunchu, uh, who's saying, well, thank you, Martha, for a fantastic presentation. You said that resilience is acquired over time. I wonder, he asks, how resilience might be different from capacities such as the evolving capacities in the Convention on the Rights of the Child. And he's referring to articles five and 14 in that respect. But this sense of evolving capacities, is that a slightly different spin on the, the, the concept of resilience that you've been looking at? Yeah, again, it, the capacities approach looks at the individual and a vulnerability analysis moves us away from the characteristics of the individual, child characteristics, fractured special legal subjectivity of the child into this larger question of state responsibility. So for example, human rights, one of the things that the, the Convention on, the, on Human Rights does, it, it, again, create a special legal subjectivity for the child, who the child who is not the uh, object of state responsibility in quite the same way as the adult because of their capacities, right? They're different capacities. Um, and so what, what, what we then do is we place that child, we think about it in terms of existing institutional arrangements and that child is placed within the family. So, you know, there's not a rethinking, which I believe strongly there should be. What is the state's responsibility to the child independent of the family? I mean, the state has an interest, and you see this in, this, in the context in the United States, in the context of education, homeschooling, private education. Should there be a public purpose uh, to education, a state interest in the child that actually transcends the interest of the family? Um, because of the, the role, again, this, the state's role, responsibility and role in the reproduction of society, in preparing future full-time citizens to assume the roles that are necessary for the reproduction of society. And the family, the family is a mediating institution that's been created that assists the state in its fundamental responsibility, but a vulnerability analysis would say that, that that construction of this mediating institution should also reflect the necessity of, um, of certain things like the educational system and the healthcare system and so forth and so on, where the state's responsibility to the child, to the individual, 
to the state's responsibility to the vulnerable subject in childhood. Again, not child as a distinct category, but the vulnerable subject in childhood, because we all go through that concept. That, that it seems to me should be the, the serious question. And it's one that we avoid by reliance on um, existing categories like the family, the way it's construed now, or in the United States, parental rights, family privacy, those things block state responsibility. Yeah, and I suppose, I mean, a, another facet of this discussion is how these concepts are differentiated in different national settings and, and what happens with the US is obviously very different to what we're seeing in Europe. Well, one of the um, things that I find really interesting, so for example, there's a vulnerability project in Sweden, which really surprises me because you, I think of Sweden is so much more advanced than the United States, but, but also I get a lot of visitors from China. Um, vulnerability theory was translated into Farsi. So I get groups in Nigeria, um, in Brazil. So one of the strengths, I think, and again, different than a human rights, which imposes a, a paradigm is the vulnerability analysis looks at your existing institutional arrangements, your existing family, your existing workplace. All societies have those. They differ across societies, but all societies have some institutional arrangements that handle these necessary functions for the reproduction of society. So you start with your institutions and, and, and ask the questions about can they be, you know, are they inclusive? Are they so forth and so on? Can they be reformed? So it's a theory that can be applied across societies. It's not dependent on a certain or a particular okay. set of institutional arrangements. We're, um, we're coming to uh, the top of the hour, but we've, we've time for one or two more questions. And I want to go to a question that's come from Balaj Apoor, who's with us. And Balaj, of course, is the director of the Trinity Center for Resistance Studies, but also uh, an expert in his scholarship on strong men, the dictator uh, discourse, which of course is, is particularly um, a, a facet of, of current European politics, but you've seen your own version of it in the US. Uh, and Balaj asks, in your view, what is the relationship between law, vulnerability and resistance or resilience in dictatorial contexts where law is used as a tool to increase the legal subject's vulnerability rather than help foster his or her resilience? Really interesting question from Balaj. Well, again, <clears throat> we wouldn't talk about it in terms of increasing vulnerability. Vulnerability is universal and constant. Um, what we would talk about is the role of law in reducing um, or blocking resilience. So what varies is not vulnerability, but the degree of resilience, which again leads us back to an institutional analysis. So strong men, although anybody who could think of Donald Trump as a strong man, <laughs> it's just, I mean, it's so absurd on its face. He's, he's not a strong man, but what he represents is a series of policies by people trying to manipulate uh, certain kinds of social forces. Uh, and dis, dis, uh, dissatisfactions and disaffections to accomplish a certain goal. Um, one of the reasons they're able to do that, and I mentioned education, we stopped teaching, um, so we stopped, stopped teaching social studies, so social responsibility in our, in our schools. We no longer have these kinds of courses that talk about democratic institutions and so forth. We allow homeschooling um, where, where the worst kinds of hatred and bias and prejudice can be imparted on children. You know, these institutional structures set the stage for exactly that kind of, it, it produces a, a population, a, a society, citizens who, who don't know how to think critically, who don't understand um, what their responsibility is. I mean, we don't teach them about their responsibility and then we trade on these pedestrian, simplistic notions of individual rights. I'm free not to wear a mask. Anybody who tells me I should get vaccinated should be shot. I have a right to, to arm myself with an A45 or whatever those rifles are. You know, all of these kinds of notions that we feed into people rather than talking about, again, um, their part in their responsibility is part of, of a, a collective that really matters that can give them a sense of identity. So, um, 
yeah, I don't know if that answers the question. And I really look forward to talking to him much more when I'm there uh, in June um, about exactly how to, to, to reconcile or not reconcile, but actually to compare um, these two different kinds of approaches. Uh, exactly, work to be done there, I think. And uh, for those of you in the audience uh, who are interested in the Center for Resistance Studies, Francesca has put the website address in the chat for you so you can follow up on their activities. Uh, I'm going to take one final question, Martha, if you have energy left, because um, I think it's a very interesting one. If I understand it correctly, I don't know if you'll agree with it, but it's coming from Noel Keane. Um, and he says institutional and social arrangements are often unconscious, and each society determines which thoughts and feelings shall be permitted to arrive at awareness as a social unconscious. What might be behind the unfolding dynamics within the international legal, legal order as a reaction and resistance to a vulnerability involving its own change? I think in that question, what I'm particularly interested in is I suppose the, this idea that there are psychological forces at play as well, which determine vulnerability or how we perceive a vulnerability. Is that a factor here or? Course, yeah. I mean, when I said vulnerability is not only about resistance, but it is also resisted. And one of the things that's resisted and, you know, I, if since 2008, when my first piece came out, there has been so much resistance around the term vulnerability and people rejecting it. I'm not vulnerable. You know, you know, other people might be vulnerable, but I'm not vulnerable. And, uh, you know, and again, I thought, what is an alternative word? Uh, and there is none that's, that's adequate. You can talk about um, weakness, but then you have strength. There's no alternative to vulnerability. There is no position of invulnerability. And we know this intuitively and we know this empirically. We are never invulnerable. We are always vulnerable, again, to this to change. And I, so I can't think of another word, although there certainly is resistance to it. Um, that should not stop anybody who's interested in applying it, in, in my opinion. Um, so I, I think you take that resistance and what you do again is you educate. I mean, I'm a professor, I believe in the force of education. I believe in logic, I believe in reasoning, even though I don't believe that's all we are. And I do think a lot of it's affected by our bodies, but certainly to explain the universality. And, and when I talk to people, in, uh, in lots of different situations, particularly young people, they, there's a way in which they really respond to this um, because the way that we think about it now, uh, I'm invulnerable and other people are injured and I have to help them, those that are discriminated, those that are poor, those that are weak. I, you know, I, the way that we think about that might make us feel good, but ultimately it doesn't really do anything to, to improve the circumstances or situations. What it does is to skim off the top most of the objections to the way that society is currently organized. So it seems to me as critical scholars, one of our obligations, one of our responsibilities is to try and present as clearly as possible um, what it is that we're, you know, our vision of social justice, our vision of what a responsive, responsible state should look like and why we need it as clearly as possible and to as, as many audiences as we can possibly, possibly reach. Well, that is a very stirring exhortation on, on which to move to a close. And uh, Martha, we've been an absolutely privileged to listen to you this evening. You've outlined vulnerability theory with such clarity that already I can see overlaps, not only with, with what's happening in resistance studies here in Trinity, but with the work very many of us are doing right across the board from language through ethics, uh, through uh, concepts of, of culture and technology. Um, so many thanks on behalf of the audience and the Trinity Long Room Hub and the Center for Resistance Studies for joining us this evening. Let me also thank Balaja Poor and the team at the Center for Resistance Studies who set this lecture up. Uh, and of course, as always to the Trinity Long Room Hub team and particularly Francesca who's uh, put everything together for us this evening. Uh, and of course, uh, thanks to our audience and for some really brilliant questions and comments that have come in. I think it shows uh, just how much this subject has touched a nerve and a seam of interest uh, 
uh, in the Trinity audience. So there will be more when uh, Martha Feynman joins us in June of next year, and we look forward to that immensely. Uh, there are many more events and lectures uh, happening through the Trinity Long Room Hub. So as always, uh, please do keep an eye on the website and sign up for things. I look forward to seeing you all again uh, at one of our events in the very near future. And until then, uh, wish everyone uh, good night and thank you. <laughs>